We have Yang Chen. It's great that we have Yang Chen here today to tell us about his work. Uh, Yang Chen is a PhD st student working with myself and Amir Masood, and uh, he's done lots of really great work in reinforcement learning. And today he's going to tell us about something that's a bit more general, a uh, new activation function for neural networks that's useful for reinforced learning and machine learning in general. So take it away, Yang Chen. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So today I'm going to introduce a new activation function, which can be used just like other well-known activation functions like ReLU sigmoid. Uh, so, and uh, this activation function is designed to learn sparse representations. So first I want to briefly go through some pre preliminaries. So sparse representation here means a representation vector where only a small percentage of units are active or non-zero. So there are lots of applications of sparse representation. It has been applied in standard regression classification, classification tasks also in image compression, autoencoder, image reconstruction. But here, our main motivating application is reducing, is to use it for reducing catastrophic forgetting. So catastrophic forgetting is also called catastrophic interference and also called representation interference. They are somewhat used interchangeably. It refers to the tendency of a artificial neural network to undesirably forget old information upon learning new information. For example, in prediction task, Updates for some input might degrade accuracy for others. I will give examples soon. So researchers usually study catastrophic forgetting by using some learning settings where there is distribution shift for sampling training data. So let's take a look at concrete example. So uh, the task is classification task and the data set is MNIST where it contains 10 handwritten digits. So instead of directly provide the algorithm with 10 digits, and uh, we, we do it in a sequential manner. The, let's say the first 1,000 steps, we provide only digits zero and one. And uh, the second 1,000 steps, we provide digit two and three. What would happen is that when we train on the digit, when we try to learn the classifier on the digit two and three, the accuracy, the prediction accuracy on zero and one would become very bad, almost become random, uh, random prediction if you like, do not use any special training technique. So I will go back to this example later to, with more details. Another example is reinforced learning setting. And uh, there are different reasons for, there is a, a distribution shift could be because different reasons. The first one is the change in policy because you are improving on policy, you are learning. So the policy decides how the data is generated. So it will change the uh, sampling distribution. It will change the data generation distribution. And there is also partial observability. And it could be also due to bootstrap estimate under function approximation. So I will go back to the two examples when I uh, show you experimental results. There are many existing works show that sparse representation is an effective method to reduce catastrophic forgetting. Here is some intuitive reason. So if you consider two extremes, the first extreme is kind of extremely sparse tabular representation, where you can think each representation vector is just a a standard basis vector. Well, there is only one non-zero entry and all others zero, and there is no overlap between representations of any two different items. So the sensible issue is that it's too expensive memory cost and or it is simply invisible if the space, sample space is too large. And of course there is no generalization. So this is actually not our goal of learning. And if on the other extreme, if the representation is too dense, the capacity may be unnecessarily large and it would induce strong interference. And for example, if you consider a, a simple regression task, you use extremely dense representation. That would mean that once you perturb any weight unit, it might perturb the output of the whole population. So the decoding and interpreting could be a very difficult task in such, for such representation. Sparse representation is kind of the balance between the two extremes. Hopefully we can reduce interference, but also we can enjoy generalization. There are, so definitely this is uh, actually already a, a popular topic, research topic, and uh, there are several category of methods. One is regularization based. The probably the most well-known one is L1 regularization. You can apply well L1 regularization on the activations. So to get sparse representation. And there is also manual truncation. And you can simply set some threshold. If the value is smaller, some threshold you set it as zero. There are also winner take or, or top K uh, strategy. You just uh, choose the most active K units. Let's say the, the activation magnitude, the largest K uh, uh, activation magnitude units, you keep them and uh, zero out all the others. So 
uh, I think we can do more. And our main idea is a bit different with existing work. And it is, we call it natural sparsity, which means we want to achieve sparsity by design or by construction, but not by learning. And uh, the idea is that uh, because when we try to introduce a sparse representation learning technique to, uh, to mitigate the catastrophic forgetting, we want to keep this method as simple as possible. So it's like a more general idea is we want to, when we introduce a problem to solve another problem, we want to make sure the introduced problem as easy as possible. Otherwise it may not work. Uh, so before I dive into the details of our activation function, I want to review some relevant background. So probably the most uh, basic uh, uh, sparse representation learning is binion operation. A binion operation is simply, uh, here is an example. It maps a scalar to one Holt vector. Let's say the input scalar is 0 0.3 and there are four bins from zero to 0.25 and from 0.25 to 0.5, from 0.5 to 0.5. Uh, 75 and from 0.75 to 1. So the bin wise is just each bin has wise 0.25. So if you do the bin operation, then it will give you a vector 0, 1, 0, 0. Because uh, the, the input 0, 3 hit the second bin. So the second unit would be 1, uh, uh, other units would be 0. So the, here is a visualization of the binning operation. So in our, in our published work, we actually call it a tidy activation. There is a reason for this. And because I think the tiring is more general and uh, you will see it later. So he, this is a visualization for, uh, it, because the, the binion has four outputs. It, it maps the scalar of uh, 0.3 to uh, four output. So the right-hand side is, a fa is, our, is the activation I'm going to introduce soon. It is called fuzzy tiling activation. Can be, this can be considered as a differentiable binion operation. And we, there, uh, you can see the highlighted region this, uh, there is a slope, so it enables backpropagation. The gradient is non-zero for those paths. So before we introduce a fuzzy tiling equation, we want to first express in a mathematical uh, formula to express the uh, binning operation. This is a formula here. It looks confusing. So I'm going to go through example with you so you can see what it is doing, what it is doing. So uh, here there are several parameters I want to explain a little. So the first vector is a C vector, which is called the tiling vector. And it basically denotes all of the cutoff values. For example, in the previous sample, the cutoff value are 0 0.25 and 0 0.5, 0 0.75, these cutoff values, and we call it tiling vector. And the delta is a bin wise. And uh, I here, I subscript uh, plus is the indicator function. In the output is one if the input is positive, otherwise zero. So let's go through example and you will see how it works. Assume the vector, the just as the previous example introduced is 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. So the bin wise delta is equal to 0.25. And consider the input again, uh, 0.3. We expect the tiling activation outputs 0, 1, 0, 0, because it hits the second bin. Then, so we start consider in the tiling activation, we consider the first maximum operation. So we will get. 0, 0, 0, 0.2, 0. 0.45 after the first maximum operation, because C minus Z would give you two negative entries. The first two elements are negative entries and take the maximum operation with zero out of the two entries. So only 0. 0.2 and 0. 0.45 remain. The second maximum operation would give you 0. 0.05 and 0, 0, 0. And uh, this, is, this is basically, we want to keep the element uh, so it will only keep the first element in the vector z minus 0 0.25 minus c. And then we, we, sum, uh, we sum the two maximum together. We will get there is only one zero entries and all others are positive entries. The second, the second entry is uh, zero, otherwise it's uh, positive. And we, if we take the indicator function, then we will get one, zero, one, one. And then we use one minus this indicator function, we get zero, one, zero, zero, as we expected. So there are two problems of this uh, activation, func uh, activation function. The gradient is zero, so it's not compatible with backpropagation always. And the second thing is it loses precision because you turn the continuous value to uh, zero one values. So it loses precision. Our solution is to design a fuzzy indicator function. It will give X when the input is smaller than, when the input X is smaller than eta. So originally if the input is smaller than zero, it will give zero. So we will kind of have a leak. Uh, 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 the fuzzy means that uh, 
mean the fuzzy means that uh, some of the if you put this oh sorry let me introduce the activation first so we will to get the fuzzy tidy information we simply replace the original indicator function uh, by the fuzzy indicator function that's the only difference and uh, after some simple calculation we can get uh, there is a deterministic sparsity guarantee for such a function we express the upper bound of number of non zero entries uh, in terms of hyperparameters of FTA. And what I want to emphasize here is that uh, this upper bound is actually very loose. If you do some simple calculation, you will see that uh, this upper bound can be achieved only when the input value hits a cutoff value. So for example, you, we have in the previous example, we have the, we have the vector C, like the point, uh, 0 0.25, 0.5. If you exactly hit like 0.25, then you might get that upper bound. So in the training setting, because we assume the input is usually considered as continuously valued random variable. So it's actually unlikely to achieve this upper bound. And I'm going to show you a learning curve about the sparsity soon. And the core one tells us how to, how to choose eta because the eta record that this eta decides how we can decide, basically it decides, uh, it, it allows a bad propagation, allows non-zero gradient and it controls the sparsity. Actually, you can look at this from the theorem one. So we can, corollary one tells us how to choose this eta if we have certain desired sparsity level, number of less than number of non-zero entries. So here is an example about the learning curve in terms of instance sparsity, which is the proportion of non-zero entries versus training number of time steps, environment time steps on the mounting car domain. So I'm not going to go to details. I do not intend to go to details about this experiment. I just want to show you a pattern. So it's almost constant. DQM with DQM dash FTA is the algorithm trend with our activation function. And uh, the, the sparsity is almost constant across the training steps. But for L1 and L2, to, uh, they are, their sparsity is kind of decreasing all the time. I will introduce the DQM RBF at a later stage. So I just want to emphasize that it is just activation function, but I want to highlight some difference with conventional activation function. This visualization is a two layer neural network with two hidden layer neural network. The first hidden layer uses ReLU. The second hidden layer uses our FTA function. The only difference is that FTA is a one-to-many mapping. If the, if the input is a scalar, then the C vector is k-dimensional, then the output will be k-dimensional. And of course, if the input uh, if the input is d-dimensional, let's say in this example, h1 times w subscript two is in is a d-dimensional vector, then the FTA returns a k times d-dimensional vector because for each element in the input vector, it augments to k-dimensional. K-dimensional is the c vector's dimension, so it outputs a k times d-dimensional vector. But the thing that the interesting thing here is that it only augments the next output's layers parameters. So if you imagine that you, if you want to use a L1 regularization to achieve sparse representation, then what you need to do is uh, to achieve the same dimensional sparse representation, then you will need to augment the parameter of W2. You need to make that matrix wide, uh, larger. So you need to make that matrix, uh, the, the number of columns should be D times K to achieve the same dimension. But in our case, W2 is still D dimensional. The column number of corners d-dimensional, and uh, it only augments the parameters in the next layer, which is output layer here. So recall that. Let's see some experiments. So recall that uh, we, our goal is to mitigate catastrophic forgetting. So we start with the synthetic data set where the sampling distribution is changing across the training time steps. And uh, my collaborator Kirby designed this nice experiment. So the basic setup is this. The goal is to approximate some function f by using data x and y. And uh, the x is the sampled according to a Gaussian distribution whose mean value is shifting across time steps. And the Kirby is able to introduce a continuous variable d to decide how dramatic the mean shift is. So let's see an example here. When d is equal to zero, it becomes IID sample. There's no distribution shift at all, at all. It's kind of standard learning setting. When d is close to one, there is dramatic shift, which is showed in the figure B. It, figure B shows the, the sampled X values and the mean and the its corresponding mean, Gaussian mean. And uh, so it's kind of when D is increasing from zero to one, the difficulty increase. So D, you can simply consider this D as training difficulty. And the figure C shows uh, the performance of our algorithm of the neural network 
trend with our uh, of the neural network equipped with our activation function and with value activation. And uh, they are evaluated on the equilibrium distribution. We are able to do this because uh, because the equilibrium distribution remains the same and re remains the same across different difficulty levels. So the X dimension is just a D, the difficulty, and the Y is the loss, is the testing loss. And we use SGD algorithms. At each time, step, we only sample a single example, training example, to train the algorithm. So you can see that our algorithm is almost consistently better across different difficulty levels. So let's go back to this example. Well, we have a, we have a data, MNIST data set, and uh, there are 10 hand return digits. So by the setting is this, uh, the first 10,000 time steps, we are only able to observe the uh, class zero and a class one. The second set, uh, the, then starting from the second thousand step, then we will only observe two and three. Then the next one will be four and, and four and five, so on and so forth. And after we go finish one pass, we will go back to zero and one. Uh, so the setting is that the algorithm is not aware when the task switches. So here is a experiment, uh, here is a result. It is a classification error on the testing data set, the whole testing data set, which includes all the uh, which includes all the uh, classes. Each class has a similar proportion. So you can see that this is actually, you might see results uh, on, on MNIST, which achieve very low error, like uh, almost almost 99% accuracy. So it's kind of lower than 1% error. But actually in this learning setting, I believe pe for people who have experience on this kind of uh, setting, it's a very challenging task to achieve that low error level. Most algorithms, if you, if you without any, uh, without any special technique, you will get like testing error probably just 0.8. You will only predict the, uh, the you will only predict uh, the classes you are currently training well, and others are kind of random prediction. So, by the way, in this uh, uh, learning curve, uh, when training the two algorithms, we apply a same uh, as the same technique to both to both type of neural network, and uh, the the reason is that. So if I do not apply any special technique, then both algorithms kind of cannot work well. But I'm not going to show that that details here, because they are the, the, the thing I want to emphasize is they are compared on a fair basis. So let's move to the reinforcement experiment. So representation in reinforcement with here is an example of representation interference in reinforcement algorithms. So unlike supervised learning setting, where we have a available training target Y. In reinforcement setting, we do not have a training target directly available. We need to estimate the target. Here, the Y is a, a bootstrap estimate. Uh, so what it means is if we update the parameter theta, then this Y value would also change. This would uh, make the algorithm very unstable. And the current popular trick is to use a target network, which is kind of separate and separate neural network and uh, to, to estimate the Y value. And this separate target network usually updated by periodically copying from theta every certain number of time steps. Or there are, there are also some other techniques. It's kind of some other technique include, uh, you can move this separate network slower on a slower time scale. And empirically, this tree kind of works very well, but it's a bit counterintuitive because when we do this, we, the new information is not immediately reflected. It's not immediately utilized. So. And from my personal experience is that uh, usually if you remove this target network, your algorithm doesn't diverge, but you often find a much worse policy as you will see soon in our experiment. And uh, uh, I think the original paper DQN who proposed this technique also, also reports a similar results. If, it, if they do not use the target network, the algorithm works much worse, the, but does not diverge. So, we fix, as you can see that uh, FTA has several hyperparameter choice and we fix the same hyperparameter, hyperparameter across all IR experiments across different neural network architectures. So here the, we first uh, show our experiments on four discrete action domains, Acrobot, Mountain Car, Cutpole, and the Lunar Lander. And the, the first three are kind of a simple task, but the Lunar Lander is uh, uh, it's non-trivial. It's not that difficult, but it's also not so easy. And I also uh, show the state dimension and action, this number of actions available on each of the uh, on each of the domain here. Here is the learning curve. So the we have uh, actually 
uh, the solid lines with the, for solid lines we have they they are trained without the target network. Those dotted lines are trained with the target network, and uh, we the DQN dash FTA is the one apply FTA on the second hidden layer, which is also the which is also the last hidden layer. We have uh, each each DQN is a two layer neural network architecture, two hidden layer neural network, and the DQN dash large is the one by using the same dimension of the second hidden layer as our FTA. So DQN dash large has much more training parameters than, our, than other algorithms. So there are two important observations here is one is the whenever our, our algorithm usually has much lower variance. I should say rigorous is, is a standard deviation. The shadow is standard deviation in the figures. We usually have a much lower standard error across random seeds. And uh, another thing I feel exciting is the Without the target network, the solid line, if you probably you can look at the echo board and uh, DQN dash FTA with the solid line, it is trained without using a target network. It can converge faster than the one with a target network. And it doesn't find the worst, it doesn't find the worst uh, policy. So it's kind of the same as those with the target network and learns much faster. So that is something I didn't observe before. So I think it should be the advantage of FTA. And uh, you might also note that on the lunar lander domain, our algorithm doesn't work that well. And uh, so I will go, I will explain the reasons later. Let's move to the continuous action uh, domains. And I also show four results here on four domains, inverted pendula, hopper, worker 2D and swimmer. And uh, they are kind of more challenging. So, Here is a learning curve. Again, the dotted lines are those algorithm trend with, uh, with the target network. So what you can see is uh, there is a similar pattern that we often observe a smaller standard error across different redundancies when using FTA activation function. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the hopper and uh, worker 2D and uh, almost on all, all of the domains, if you compare FTA with those ReLU trend with the target network is always better. Although on the although it may not be able to outperform the DDPG with large. By the way, DDPG is just a continuous control algorithm by using deep, uh, by using terms policy gradient method. So you can also see that there is a one domain swimmer here, which doesn't work that well. And uh, uh, my current conjecture that the reason behind the, the uh, poor performance on swimmer and on the previous lunar lander uh, should be similar, and I will address them together later. So here is a sanity check for to compare our algorithm with other sparse representation learning technique. We compare with L1, the L2 regularization. So L2 rigorously, they are not sparse. By the way, rigorously, they are all of them are actually not sparse because for floating point, floating value, float values, you cannot really observe the value exactly equal to zero. They usually have some very small numbers, and they do have effect from my experience. We so here the RBF, the DQN with RBF is the is considered as a we in the RBF setting, RBF uh, setting, we consider the k-dimensional tidying vector C as k centers. So it, it can be also considered as a natural sparse representation learning technique, but you just need there is no like simple way to choose the bandwidth. There is a bandwidth limit parameter inside. And if you can choose that well. DQN dash RBF can indeed work well. So I suggest people who is interested in this direction, you might check out our paper. So the, the message is, is similar. Our algorithm basically outperform all others. And again, on the lunar lander, it doesn't work that well. I want to point out the two limitations of FTA. One is about numerical stability and another one is hyperparameter sensitivity. So the first one is the, the numerical stability. If you look at the fuzzy indicator function, you will see that FTA is discontinuous at x equal to eta. So this can be seen from the, if you look at the activation, uh, if you look at the fuzzy indicator function, the first formula in, on this slide, if you, the left limit and the right limit are not equal. So you can, I, I visualize this by using the uh, a simple tire uh, FTA setting, the tire vector bound is from negative 20 to 20, and there are five beans. So each bean has a y is eight. The output is, is a five dimensional vector. I only visualize two dimensional, the zero dimension and one dimension here on the visualization. And I circle out the two discontinuous point on the two dimensions. You can see there is kind of sharp jump. 
So that would incur numerical stability. It turns out that there is a simple fix for this. We can simply divide this X by eta. And uh, this X divided by eta is always less than one because that uh, the corresponding, the, the, the term uh, I uh, subscript uh, plus with uh, input as eta minus X. So this would be one only when X is less than eta. So this value will be always less than one. You can look at the visualization on the right-hand side on this slide. The left-hand side is the one, one without the fix. The right-hand side is the one with the fixed numerical issue. So there is no longer the sharp, uh, the sharp change. Uh, then let's discuss the parameter sensitivity. I'm going to go through the, uh, all of the important parameter choice. And actually there is only one of them is very sensitive. So the first one I want to go through is uh, the ETA parameter, which is the sparsity control parameter. The from a, in a mathematical sense is purpose is simply to enable back propagation. And uh, if you do some simple calculation, you will see that if you the minimum value of eta to ensure non-zero gradient everywhere within the tiring bound is to set eta equal to delta. You can see a visualization here. The visualization is actually using eta equal to delta. You can see that the gradient is non-zero everywhere because this is a one-to-many mapping. As long as any one of the uh, any one of the out element in the output vector gives a non-zero gradient, then your gradient will be non-zero. So, th so this parameter, we actually, in all of the previous experiments, we keep this, keep using this heuristic, eta set equal, eta equal to delta. So another parameter choice is sensitive, which is a tiling bound. And uh, it could be results in a neon dice. Some, if you consider the example, let's say the tiling bound from, from zero to one, and if the input is outside that range, then the gradient will become zero again, the neuron dies. It may, and also it may lead to very strong interference or the contrary, very poor generalization. Given, let's consider that if we have a fixed number of beams, and if you use a very large bound, that indicate very large beams. So you can imagine that many of the inputs would hit the same beam. So even though you have a sparse representation, but your representation overlap with each other. And if the bound is too small, it may lead to the lack of generalization or dead neurons. So we can, uh, I'm going to measure the overlap sparsity as a measure for representation interference. The overlaps, the, so uh, the instance sparsity is the proportion of non-zero entries in the feature vector for each instance. The overlap sparsity is uh, defined as the, uh, the simultaneously activated units between two representation vectors. The proportion of such sim simultaneously activated units. So the representation interference, I use overlap sparsity divided by the instance sparsity. So uh, I want to remind you that because before I show you the learning curves uh, with different tiling bound and the learning curve of overlap sparsity of the sparsity ratio, I want to remind you the performance, the learning curve in terms of the episodic return. Here, our algorithm doesn't work well. And this is one is using the tiling bound equal from negative 20 to 20. And now I'm going to show you different learning curves in the middle figure uh, with different uh, tiling bound. You can see that uh, among those, among those uh, tested bounds, only the tiling bound equal to one or 0.1, they work the best they, they can, and work similarly well and they converge to a similar point, similar policy in terms of episodic return. So, and uh, all others, if you, if you further decrease the tiling bound to 0 0.01, the performance become better again. And if you use large uh, tiling bound, the performance also become, also become bad. So the right-hand side show you the representation interference versus number of time steps. And the, so it's basically the sparsity ratio versus time steps. So you can see that although, although the learning curve, although the uh, absolute return is bad when you use Tiling bound equal to 0 0.01 and 10 and 20, but they kind of have different reason. If you look at the sparsity ratio versus time, time steps learning curve, uh, the, the right hand side, the, the right bottom learning curves, those, uh, the learning curve corresponding to the small tiling bound 0 0.01, which is on the bottom, they have very low sparsity ratio, which means they have very low representation interference. But the tiling bound with large values, 10 and 20, they are actually among the top. They have very large overlap. So that means the poor performance of using a very small tiling bound on this domain should be because 
it lacks of generalization. But the reason about the reason the tiling bound equal to 10 or 20, they perform bad should be because there is a strong uh, representation interference. So this tiling bound is definitely a sensitive, is a sensitive uh, parameter. And we will introduce some way to resolve it. One last thing is uh, how to choose the number of beams or tiles. I personally think it's more like a budget issue because you want to have sparse representation, then you definitely need a higher dimensional representation. But as a standard check, I also show visualize the, uh, I should visualize the uh, learning curves by using, I fix the bound, but I, but I uh, vary the number of, number of beams. On the left hand side, I show the DQN with FTA activation function. On the right hand side, I use DQN with value. And uh, instead of vary the number of tiles, so on the DQN, I, the different learning curves corresponding to different number of uh, hidden units in the second hidden layer. So you can see that uh, our superior performance is not due to is uh, is not due to uh, the larger parameter, uh, and but for DQN, you actually if you, if you increase the uh, uh, size of the second hidden layer, it doesn't actually change much of, of your performance. But for our algorithm, as long as you fix the uh, you, as long as you use a reasonably large number of tiles, it it can uh, has a significant improvement. So how can we choose a tiling vector C? The, basically, we choose that we need to choose tiling bound given a fixed uh, number of beams, and we 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 propose a multi-tiling solution. And but before that, I want to briefly review tile coding in case that so uh, because it's kind of the the it is inspired by the tile coding. So for tile coding, let's say we want to tile code two input z and z prime to an eight dimensional vector. There are two tilings here corresponding to two tiling vectors. So if you can, you, you can see that they, the, by the way, the two tiling vectors have different starting point. The first tiling starting from negative 0 0.05 and the second starting from zero. And uh, this small offset value actually results in a generalization between the two distinct input, scalar input. So you can see that Z and the Z, Z prime would hit, both of them would hit six, uh, six tile six, or six beam. And uh, but they will hit different, the, but Z will hit on the first tiling vector, Z will hit the second beam and the Z prime would hit the third beam. And the tile coding basically concatenated the, the same, actually the same as us, we, you just concatenate the, uh, the zero, the one hot vector corresponding to the uh, two tiling vectors. But the, in this case, multi-tiling in tile coding is actually used for enable generalization. But in our case, we use multi-tiling to address the sensitivity of the tiling bound issue. So here, recall this uh, example where we apply FTA on the second hidden layer. So what we do is uh, we, we, when we apply FTA on the second hidden layer, we can define, let's say the, hit, the second hidden layer has D output units. So we apply, we define D different tiling vectors with different ranges. To, so, uh, so, it, so that it can uh, kind of include a different, so, so uh, it can achieve some, some sort of domain insensitivity. Some domain you might want large different tiling bounds, but some are not. So we can, we can define the different tiling vectors with different ranges. So hopefully it's not that sensitive. So the left hand side, I show you the result of Lunar Lander. The right hand side, I show you on the continuous control domain swimmer. Uh, I compare the, I put both, the FTA with multiple tiling and uh, the a fixed bound on both sides. On bo you can see that uh, with the FTA with multi tiling actually works definitely works better. But what I usually observe is that let's say on the lunar lander, if I uh, recall that the best bound should be from should be one from negative one to one, and what will happen is if you use multi tiling, and the, what will happen is the learning curve usually between the best one and the worst one. So I feel somewhat this method is not good enough. So we have ongoing work to use adaptive fuzzy tiling activation. So the, where well, the tiling bound can be considered as a training variable and uh, it can be learned in an end-to-end -end manner. So this, here is some result. The, the left two are using the uh, adaptive tiling bound. So it, it works much better than the previous one if you look at the relative performance between the uh, black solid line to the blue solid line. So this one definitely works better. The blue lines are not changed. The blue and red line not changed, uh, not, are not changed. So, and also on the swimmer, it also achieves superior performance. 
So there are here are a few future and ongoing directions. The first one is the adaptive FTA, as I mentioned, and uh, and the utility of FTA in general distribution shift problem. And the third one is FTA for efficient exploration in the representation space. We have some preliminary experiment in this direction. And uh, the basic idea is that we want to encourage the, we want to design the bonus to encourage the agent to activate uh, now to, to activate those units not, that are not that frequently activated. And the fourth direction is uh, we can use multi-tiling as a meta-knowledge injection approach. Because what I'm thinking is that if you consider FTA as a binning operation, so if you uh, if you design if you define different number of uh, bins, it essentially means it essentially means you how find the information you want to retain. So I feel like different units should have different a uh, uh, different level of should keep different uh, level of details. So you might use this method as a meta knowledge injection approach. And uh, the last one is uh, it could be interesting to show the convergence of neural network with FTA activation function. And uh, the reason is that because sparse representation is very well studied, but there is not yet uh, results uh, to establish the convergence property uh, uh, between the, uh, there, there's no result to characterize the relation between the sparsity and uh, the convergence rate by using sparse representation technique. So this could be a, a promising direction to to have some theoretical insight of why sparse representation can help or may not help. So uh, thanks. Um, I just want to mention that eight, uh, about 70% of this representation is from the published paper, uh, Fuzzy Tidy Activations, and uh, is co work with Kirby, Bam, and uh, Martha White. Thank you. So are there any questions? No, is it because uh, all of you are completely lost? <laughs> Not me. Okay. Okay, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm. um, so for the adaptive approach, one of your initial motivations, I suppose, was to have, mm -hmm. I don't know what you were calling natural sparsity. If now mm -hmm. you're going to have to optimize for the tiling bound, is that somehow um, going against this natural sparsity view? No, it doesn't. The sparsity is still guaranteed. It depends on how we design the adaptive bound. Yeah. So what we what we do is currently, let's say we fix the same, we fix a k is a number of beans. We fix a k, and uh, the way we generate the tiling vector c is to we we de we define a variable. Let's say the, the variable, and then add k times delta two k times uh sorry add delta and then add two times delta add three times delta, and uh, we fix uh we fix the the parameter control parameter eta equal to delta, so we are able to fix the sparsity. So it doesn't it doesn't destroy the sparsity control. Okay, now I don't I don't really understand why it is that this bound went from minus twenty to twenty um, internally inside the network. Why does it matter if features can be so large? So why would we want features minus twenty to twenty? So could could you say your question again? I don't. Um, can you tell me, do you have an idea why it is that for one of the environments that you needed this width, this tiling bound to be wide, like from minus 20 to 20, and but for a bunch of them, you didn't need it to be so wide? Uh, I think an intuitive reason is that you see on the Mujoko domain, there could be very large values, the, uh, the input values, right? So it would result in very different output. But, I mean, the output, the, the input results in different input for the FTA. So, yeah. That's a, I think that's a direct reason. Okay, so can you say more? So in Majoko, could would an alternative strategy have been to make sure all your domains have normalized inputs? No, I don't normalize any input. Or the, if the input have very different numerical scale, right? They cannot you cannot ensure they will concentrate on within the negative twenty to twenty. So, 
So the so the, the bound the negative 20 to 20 is kind of, a, for some domain, it might be too large. For some, it could be too small. On the Mujoko, I usually found it, it prefers kind of a larger bound because the input have, have a bigger, have a larger numerical time scale. Sorry, numerical scale, not time scale, sorry. <laughs> I think it's not unreasonable to assume that the agent could track the size of the inputs and try to normalize them in some way, let's say between minus one and one. So anyway, imagine that you could do that, then do you think it would be less sensitive to this tiling bound? Uh, I guess so. I guess so, but I'm not sure whether it should be a strong assumption, right? For the, if you are able to normalize the input. I think it's a strong assumption, but if you are able to do that, I think it would be less sensitive, yes. I have another question. Sure. Um, for catastrophic forgetting and reinforcement learning, you said like one of these distribution shifts mm. is from the change in policy. And is there any incentive in RL to remember information about old policies as you're like as you're improving in your control? Uh so I have uh, so we can we can think of like a concrete example. Let's say on the grid world and uh, uh, on a grid wall, you, you go from left to bottom to right top, and you you still want some states. You, you want to ensure your buffer have sufficient state coverage because otherwise, even if you find the optimal trajectory, then you might overfit into that trajectory and the, your policy becomes worse on the other part, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so like, it's still about uh, forgetting about all states and not like about the value for it's not the it's not forgetting the value estimates of old policies that's hurting it's forgetting information about unvisited states that's hurting so like no. my, my point is that mm. so as, as you improve in control and change your policy then your mm. value the correct values also change and like the correct targets also change because your policy has changed mm. And uh, my question, my point is that I think, well, the, the fact that the targets have changed due to the actual change in policy is mm. not important here. It's just your visitation distribution that has changed and also the targets changing because of bootstrapping is important. Mm. Because bootstrapping is important. So, oh, um, yeah, so like okay, let, let's say we, we didn't have bootstrapping and it was Monte Carlo and like we could get a state uh, uh, IID from, mm. we had like good uh, uh, samples from all the states. Mm. Still, as you're doing control, your policy itself is changing and we mm. want to estimate VPI, mm. right? So the current, mm. the correct, the correct function that we want to estimate is also changing because like our policy is changing. Yes. So it's a kind of change in the in the task, mm -hmm. and my point is that this change in the task is not really relevant. Oh, for okay. For I, I, because we don't really need to remember information about old policies. Mm. It's not really likely that we will visit those. Uh, yes, yes. So, so that means, right? So the change in policy is not. Uh, so it definitely introduced this field shift, but that is not something we want to resolve here. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I should remove that. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. But as on also that um uh as your policy changes, I think um you might there are some scenarios you might want to learn from data generated under a past policy, but you you don't want it to interfere too much with your current value estimates and your current policy, right? Yes, yes, that's true. But still, I think Eslan's bringing up a good point about what does it even mean to do interference when your thing that you're trying to learn is changing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if we have the best definitions of interference in RL because of that. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I was waiting for someone to say it. <clears throat> when we try to measure interference, we exactly said, we're gonna fix the policy for a little while. So at least it sort of makes sense that we're asking, did we interfere in our value estimates? I guess we hope though that our value estimates under an old policy tell us something about our value estimates in our new policy. So there's, you know, interference could still make sense there, but it would take some thought to figure out 